Today, we'll be looking at a story from the North African campaign of the Second World War. The story begins in June of 1942. Flight Sergeant Dennis Copping, age 24, was part of No. 260 Squadron in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserves, flying Curtis P-40 Kitty Hawks. Operating out of Al-Wadi Al-Jahid in northern Egypt, Copping was to take one of the P-40s, serial code ET-574, on a ferry flight to a neighbouring British airbase to have the undercarriage repaired, as it would no longer retract. This was probably in preparation for the upcoming summer offensive as part of the effort to field all available aircraft for it. On the 28th of June, he would subsequently take off with the lowered undercarriage, heading west. This would be the last time that Dennis Copping was seen. One source claims that a fellow pilot of 260 Squadron would see that Copping was flying off in the wrong direction and tried to get his attention, but to no avail. The aircraft and pilots were reported missing after several hours, as is clear from the archive reports, but as to the whereabouts of both aircraft and pilots, this would remain a mystery for 70 years. It's unclear if an attempt to find Copping was actually made after his disappearance. Search and rescue missions in the Sahara are notoriously difficult. The rough terrain would have made it almost impossible to land a rescue aircraft, and the complete lack of landmarks would have made it difficult for land-based rescuers to zero in on a location spotted from the air. Fast forward to April 2012, and workers for a prospecting Polish oil company discovered the remarkably well-preserved remains of a P-40. The extremely dry conditions had served to mummify the aircraft, which had minimal rust and decay, though it had been sandblasted by decades in the scorching heat and wind. The wings were half buried under the sand, but in good condition, though the fabric-covered control surfaces had long since rotted away, and the cockpit was moderately intact and seemingly undisturbed from the day it had crashed. The plane seemed frozen in time, with live ammunition still loaded in the magazines of the fighter's six machine guns and due to the plane's remarkably good condition, identifying it was a fairly easy task, and it was linked very quickly to Copping, who had been filed as missing 69 years, 9 months, and 14 days earlier. Conspicuously missing from the crash site, however, was any sign of human remains, which could only mean one thing. Copping had survived the crash landing. The big question was now, what had happened to him? Well, considering where Copping's P-40 found itself, it was clear that at some point during the flight a navigation error was made, and the aircraft would run low on fuel almost 300 kilometres from the closest inhabited area, and 370 kilometres southwest of Cairo. Copping may have chosen to land before he completely ran out of fuel though, as the propeller found in the desert was twisted in a way that was consistent with rough landings that were done under power, but it's impossible to confirm this, and the P-40 may well have come down in a dead stick landing. Despite said landing ripping the propeller clean off, as well as tearing the gearing unit from the bowels of the engine, the emergency landing was successful, which was quite a feat considering Copping had no choice but to land with the landing gear extended, and in the soft terrain of the desert, that carried a serious risk of his aircraft digging in and nosing over. But his P-40 did not flip over, and the unlucky airman had survived the impact, only to find himself in the middle of the desert. Perhaps it would have been kinder if the landing had actually killed Copping outright, as he was now alone and lost in the middle of the largest desert on Earth, and RAF aircraft of the day would usually carry very little in the way of rations, a small amount of food and water that would suffice for perhaps a day or two at most, and he was far more than two days of travel from the nearest civilization. An investigation at the crash site revealed that there had been a small makeshift camp built next to the aircraft, apparently made using the silk from his parachute. The aircraft's battery and radio were also discovered there, hinting that Copping had attempted to broadcast a call for help. It was tragically discovered that the internal workings of the radio had been destroyed in the landing, which must have been a demoralising realisation for Copping after labouring in the searing heat for nothing. At some point following this, Copping decided to leave his camp and make an attempt to find salvation, and this is where the trail effectively ends to this day. 
A breakthrough shortly after the discovery of the wreck came when a group of Italian historians discovered a number of human bones, located only five kilometres from the crash site. Though after a brief investigation, it was apparently decided that these did not belong to Copping. Copping's living relatives have disputed with various officials, both in Egypt and in the UK, about the remains, as it appears they were claimed to have been far too old to have been those of the missing pilot, though a DNA test was never conducted. It remains an ongoing case, with a number of forensic pathologists interested in going personally to attempt a DNA extraction. It's worth mentioning that discovered alongside the bones were a section of the parachute, a key fob, and a buckle stamped 1939, which is fairly compelling evidence that these bones are in fact the remains of the British pilot, and that they were wrongly dated. But there is more to the mystery. Some believe that Copping may have been shot down, due to the fact that there is flak damage scattered around the fuselage. It's more likely that this was previously attained battle damage and was part of the reason that the aircraft was being ferried for repairs, though it seems unusual that they would not have been patched over before flight, as that would have been standard practice. This adds another element of uncertainty to the mystery surrounding the aircraft, and it's one that's never been fully explained. After a total of 25,490 days under the Saharan skies, Copping's P-40 was transported to El Alamein and put into storage, eventually being restored and put on display outside the War Museum. The Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon expressed interest in a trade deal, but the negotiations with Egyptian officials eventually fell through. ET-574 unfortunately now sports a historically inaccurate camouflage scheme, and is considered to have been somewhat rather poorly restored, though it has at least been saved from scrapping, and could one day perhaps be subject to a more historical and thorough restoration program. Many people hope for this, as the aircraft has special significance, not only because of the story behind it, but also because it's the sole surviving example of a Desert Air Force P-40 Kitty Hawk, just one of over 3,000 built. Had fate been kinder, had the radio not been rendered inoperable upon landing, this could have ended as a very different story. For now, we can only suppose that Copping died somewhere in the Sahara of exposure after walking for some time, and he remains there to this day. The desert would have been around 35 degrees Celsius at that time of the year, and being 300 kilometres away from the closest settlement, such a trek would have been virtually impossible with no chance of survival, which Copping couldn't have known at the time, or had he known, there was nothing he could have done about it anyway. Today, you can visit Dennis Copping's memorial site and pay your respects to him, along with the many others who gave their lives in service in North Africa, at the Alamein Memorial in Egypt. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you, of course, to the patrons. Now, this is the first video I've recorded with my new microphone, so I hope the audio quality is alright. I'll work on improving things as we go. A big shout out as well to the Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a big welcome to Caleb, who is the newest member of this special group. I also hope you enjoyed a slight change in video theme today. I plan to cover a few more aviation stories in the future, as I think it makes a nice change of pace. But as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.